So just having watched that again off of, it's a, kind of an edited version from Right Now Media, just a reminder that we have, since uh, September, I believe, uh, free, or you have free access to Right Now Media. If you do not have it at this point, all you need to do is email me your email address, and we can set you up with all sorts of, there's you know, tens, tens of thousands of uh, Bible study resources, um, kids programming such as this, and it is also, as I said at the beginning, it is something that you can uh, hand off, if you will, to your kids or grandkids or people in your neighborhood. They can have free access to this as well. They just need to be in touch with me. All right, so this week we're going to turn to the book of, or to the end of the book of Genesis. So two weeks ago, we set off on our year-long journey of reading or listening and preaching through the Bible. And as was the case last week, and it will be the case this year, the entire year, it is not too late for you to start. There's still copies in the back at the table as you walk in of our reading plan. You can find them on the church website. Now, before we start our journey this morning, let's go back again. We're not too far removed from the beginning. Let's talk about the first two weeks here real quick. If you have not been present for either Sunday or you missed one of the services, I'd, I'd encourage you to go to the website and listen to those messages because as I've said both weeks, those two messages are really foundational for everything else in the Bible and everything else really that we're going to talk about this year. And so if you recall, the first week we talked about the fact that we needed to have most crucial time spent on the true nature of sin. And that if we want to hit the bullseye, remember the arrow analogy, if we want to hit the bullseye, we need to have the correct aim and release point. And we talked about that being that the gospel is based around the idea that God is to be our leader. That sin is a leadership issue. I talked about this this morning with a couple of men, that when sin shows up in our lives, at the very most basic level, it is because we distrust or don't believe something that God said. And so then we see the massive fallout that results from this sin. When we allow uh, God to be taken out of right leadership. Now last week, we skipped forward and we acknowledged the fact that even in the face of our insurrection... That through Adam and Eve's original sin, their choice to decide that they were going to attempt to lead their own lives, that God still leads in a trustworthy way. Remember, he made covenants with Noah, and we focused on the covenants with Abram. We make contracts, and we sign documents and promises, and we break them oftentimes with an unbelievable uh, callousness for what the fallout may be. But God makes covenantal promises that are good forever. God is not in, prim in prison to our whims. But he shows us even more that he, is, he wants what's best for us because he saved us from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin in spite of the fact that we deny or that we uh, defy him often in sinful ways. So this week we turn to the story of Joseph. And we're going to read seven verses in Genesis chapter 50. But we're going to, as I've been doing so far this year, I'm going to kind of go through the story of Joseph uh, this morning. So, Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21, it will be up on the screen, or you can read from the Bible. When Joseph's brothers had seen that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us, and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent instructions to Joseph, saying, Your father commanded us before he died, saying, This is what you shall say to Joseph. Please forgive, I beg you, the offense of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. 
And now, please forgive the offense of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to save many lives. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. My sermon in a sentence this week is this. Those who understand God's providence have joy even in the midst of suffering. A joy reflected on their very faces, for they see that their suffering is not without purpose. Now, when I read those seven verses that I just read, one verse pops right off the page. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about this present result. Now, this kind of a statement, if someone were to tell you that in their life, it begs the backstory. You'd want to know, well, what led you to this place that you can recognize something so powerful? Now, let's go back to the life of Jacob, Joseph's father, for just a minute. One phrase that could be associated with Jacob's life was turmoil resulting from favoritism. Remember that Jacob was not Isaac's son. So we're going back a couple generations. Jacob was not Isaac's oldest son. And thus, he was not entitled to receive a double portion of his father's inheritance, which was rightly supposed to go to Esau. However, as we read in the text, his mother favored, Joseph, or favored Jacob, and they plotted together to get Jacob the inheritance. Then, Jacob, later on, works for seven years for Laban under the premise that he would be able to marry Rachel, Laban's daughter, the, one that he, the woman that he favored. But remember, Laban, after the seven years of service, tricks Jacob, and he ends up marrying the oldest daughter, Leah, instead. And so after agreeing to an additional seven years of labor, Jacob marries Rachel. Now Leah, we read, was blessed with many children, but Rachel was barren. Now, by all rights, Reuben, the first child of Jacob and Leah, was entitled to receive a double portion of their father's inheritance. Yet we see throughout the story that Jacob favors his son Joseph, who was eventually the firstborn son of Rachel. Okay, In the line of things, uh, what we read is that Jacob had 13 children. Jake, or, uh, Joseph was number 12 out of the 13. Just as an aside, I was looking at this. In Deuteronomy, there was a specific passage in Deuteronomy 21 that mirrors this situation. It says, here's, or here's the summary of that passage. It says that if a man has two wives, the oldest son, catch this, the oldest son is to get the double portion even if he is not the oldest son of the more beloved wife. And what we read of repeatedly in Genesis is that Rachel was Jacob's more beloved wife. So catch that as part of the premise in this story. So jo Joseph deserves nothing in terms of this inheritance, uh, the double inheritance piece. Now, in Genesis chapter 37, verse 3, we read Israel. Now, remember, by this point in time in Genesis, Jacob had wrestled with God, and God changes Jacob's name to Israel. So Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons. Whew, for those of you who are parents, you know how 
or that had a parent that you, that you maybe talked about, oh man, they, my parents favored such and such a kid. You know, that can stir, stir, stir the pot a little bit. Now, as an outward sign of this uh, favor, he gave Joseph a tunic of many colors. Okay, very familiar part of the story. But there's something in there that's deeper than just this, this tunic. It signified a position of favor, a princely standing, and the birthright. It was a dramatic way of saying that he was the son, that Joseph was the son to receive the birthright. Now, reading on in Genesis 37, verse 4, the very next verse, it says, His brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than the other sons, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then, Joseph adds insult to injury by sharing two dreams that God placed in his head about his brothers having to submit to, to Joseph's leadership or reigning over them. And not only that, but that also Jacob, his dad, would also bow to him. Now picture that for just a minute. If you had a sibling that came to you, or you know, a sibling that came to you and said, You will bow before me, and by the way, Dad, you too will also bow before me. How do you think that's going to go over? So now we read that jealousy is now mixed in with increasing hatred. This is a deadly combination. And that rears our its head in our day too. The brothers plot his demise, but after some squabbling, it's agreed that they will sell him into slavery instead. So Joseph is carried off to Egypt, unsure what his future holds. So my first point this morning is that what was meant for evil, God uses to strengthen our character. You see, as we've talked about already this year, God is primarily after followers who are trustworthy, who will trust his leadership wherever it takes you. In Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10, we read, See, I have refined you. Though not as silver, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Joseph had every right to be bitter and angry. He could have blamed his brothers or even God for where his life took him. And yet, when he arrives in Egypt, we read in Genesis chapter 39 that the Lord was with Joseph in every way. Joseph knew God and was known by God. Instead of allowing the evil actions of his brothers to ruin his life, Joseph faithfully followed God. In fact, he followed God so faithfully that it was apparent even to the Egyptian master who was over him. Because of this faithfulness, Joseph became a personal servant, an overseer of his household and all that he owned. And we read that God blessed the Egyptian. Why? On the account of Joseph. So let's personalize this for a moment. When someone has or someone tries to hurt you in some way. Do you remain faithful to God? Or does that throw you off of the path of life? Now another trial is put in Joseph's path through the interaction with Potiphar, who was the wife of his master. She makes advances at Joseph, but Joseph stands firm and resists her. But in response, 
Potiphar trumps up false accusations leading to a wrongful imprisonment of Joseph. Now the famous poet Henry Thoreau once said, Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also in prison. Add Potiphar to the laundry list of reasons that Joseph could have blamed for the state of his life. Yet Joseph continues to remain faithful, now even finding favor with the chief jailer. He was so entrusted that Joseph was now given charge over all the prisoners and all the things, every single thing that was done there. Joseph is continuing to be a faithful follower, and God is increasing Joseph's responsibilities. Let's up the personal ante here a little bit. When someone lies about you, or attacks your character, do you seek revenge? Do you live with bitterness? Or do you remain faithful to God. We don't read anything in here about Joseph defending himself. Doesn't mean he didn't do that, but we don't know that. He continues to not allow what other people do to him to dictate his relationship with God. Now, Joseph then reveals the meaning of some more dreams. This time he reveals them to the chief cupbearer and baker who had been thrown in jail. Now, Joseph tells the cupbearer, the chief cupbearer, this was the man who was responsible for the life of Pharaoh. And so what the chief cupbearer would do would be, whenever food or drink was brought to Pharaoh, it was the chief cupbearer's responsibility to uh, test it for safety. Drink to see if there was poison, or eat to make sure that the food was uh, not intended for harm. Now, he tells him that he is going to be restored to the kingdom, back to his place. And he says, when you, re when you are restored, don't forget me. But then we read the cupbearer forgot Joseph. Just one more person to blame, right? And yet God continues to work. Now he gives Pharaoh a dream, just two years later. And it's because of this dream that all of a sudden the cupbearer says, Oh, Master, I, just, I remember this guy. He's down in prison, and he told me the meaning of my dream. Let's go bring him up here. And so God reveals the meaning of Joseph's, I'm sorry, of Pharaoh's dream through Joseph. Upon hearing this revelation, Pharaoh tells Joseph, You shall be in charge of my palace, and all of the people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the kingdom, or to the throne, will I be greater than you. And so as a culmination of the fact that God... Our trustworthy leader, as I said, he's looking for leader or for followers who are trustworthy. You want to find, find a guy who is faithful to him in all circumstances? Look at Joseph. So he had found someone who through the tests of life was found faithful, and so he hands the keys to the kingdom of Israel, or I'm sorry, to the kingdom of Egypt to Joseph. In Luke chapter 16, verse 10, we read, The one who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much. And the one who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous in much. What was meant for evil in Joseph's life, 
God used to strengthen his character. We've all faced afflictions. The question is, have those afflictions led you to be embittered or have they refined you to be a more faithful follower of Christ, seeking to obey all that God has commanded? Secondly, what was meant for evil, God uses, uh, uses to show us who the provider is, even to the point of salvation. Now, as Joseph's story continues, more dreams are revealed. God shows Joseph that, they are, that Egypt is going to have seven good years and seven years of severe famine. We are reminded in this that who is the provider of food and who has control over everything in our world. He is the provider of wisdom and discernment revealed in that we need to rightly manage our resources when we have an excess in order that we may help others when resources are at a premium. In Matthew chapter 6, we understand that God provides for our daily needs. Yet there is an even greater act of evil here that leads to a greater salvation. Even though God was Jesus was God in the flesh, he also endured affliction, temptation, trials, and the entire forces of evil. Because he is the only man to have ever walked this earth as a perfectly trustworthy follower of the Father, Jesus was entrusted with the ultimate responsibility, <coughs> dying on the cross for all humanity. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God has offered you the opportunity to end your insurrection against God, to repent and to switch sides from following the sinful flesh and instead following the Spirit, becoming a faithful follower of Christ, living a life obedient to God's loving leading. There is no greater gift and not one that we should take lightly. Are you willing to die to your flesh daily to carry your cross for Christ? To entrust yourself to allow God to transform you into a faithful follower. Because the battles of life are present, whether you want them or not, whether you've experienced them to the degree that you will or not. They are to help us be found faithful to our King. And if, you, if, if your answer to that is no, at this point, or if your answer is, I don't know. What's holding you back? The supreme God of the universe. Remember, in chapter 1 of Genesis, we read that God's name was Elohim. God over everything. The supreme God. He is the same God, Yahweh, that we read in Genesis chapter 2, who wants a personal relationship with you. Even as I say that now, having heard that for 30, almost 38 years of my life, that thought still resonates with an unbelievable power that a God that is overall cares enough about us. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus. It's time to let go of whatever control you're trying to keep in your life and look to Jesus. And finally, what was meant for evil, God uses to further his kingdom. 
Now recall in the Great Commission, the apostles and other believers had been mandated with the, great, with the greatest, enormous, most res, uh, responsibility of spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now catch this, because this is something I didn't catch for many years with this story. Several years went by. So they've been told, get out there to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the world, and spread the gospel. And yet several years later, we read two things. First, the number of followers of Jesus were being added daily. That's a good thing. That's what we want to see. Yet... Christianity mainly existed in Jerusalem and the immediate surrounding areas. They were huddling together and they built a great bond and they were growing. But they were neglecting part of what Jesus had said to them. They were not going out. And so what happens? God says it is time to break the huddle. We talked about the huddle here last week. It's time to break the huddle. Well, they're not doing it on their own, so here's what's happening. The great persecution. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, On the day of the stoning of Stephen, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered. This persecution was meant for evil. Now, I purposely left off the last four words in that verse. Because in those four words, we are revealed what the, how this evil was used for good. On the day of the stoning, a great persecution broke out against the church, and all except the apostles were scattered to Judea and Samaria. He's moving them as he has called them to be moved. Now recall in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, God told them, and I already said this, you will receive power when the Spirit comes, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem has been witnessed to. Now evil in the form of persecution is what's used to force them to break out of our or their comfort zone. He's reaching his second phase of his mission, Judea and Samaria. Now the small church fled to the country. They scattered. And the idea of holding a Sunday service at the local church building was not even on the radar. But God blessed it. By the time we read, or we flip over to Acts chapter 9, we read that not only was the church growing, it was multiplying rather than just simply adding. When we break our huddle this morning, or on any Sunday morning, where are you scattered to? What places in this life are you sent to? How are you using your position in those places where God has planted you to multiply the kingdom? This is what each one reach one is about. It's where we are, love people, help them know Christ, find Christ, and then help them grow to know uh, and obey all that God has commanded. Now the title for my sermon was found in verse 20, which I read at the beginning where Joseph is standing before his brothers. Remember that the brothers, I mean, you know the story, I'm sure. It's a very familiar story. All that the brothers put him through, and they're worried that Joseph will repay them for all they've wronged him. Now, if you were in Joseph's position, what do you think you would do? Yet Joseph says, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. Why? In order to bring about the present result. Joseph told his brothers, using a Hebrew word 
that traces its meaning to the word weave. So really, Joseph here is saying, you wove evil, but God rewove it so that it would be good. Much evil in words and actions have taken place in this country in recent times. This evil is intended to distract us and divide us. But there is good that comes out of it. God is reminding us of the hopelessness of entrusting ourselves to the leadership of any human. There is only one who restrains us from evil. The Holy Spirit. Our hope is found in Christ alone. Much evil has been woven into our lives. It can drive us each to places of despair, anger, and jealousy. Or it can drive us to our knees, devoting our lives to becoming faithful followers that God longs to bless and use. It's time to get your house in order. It's time to get your priorities straight. The stories of our lives are not a series of unrelated happenings, but are intended by God to be woven together into a beautiful tapestry, reflecting the loving leader that God is. In 2021, let it be said that, uh, that those of us here journey together, weaving our lives together, and with those in our community, serving God in such a way that just like those around Joseph, they couldn't help but acknowledge Him, God, who is in our lives. And so we close again with our sermon in a sentence. Those who understand God's providence have joy even in the midst of suffering. A joy reflected on their very faces. For they see that their suffering is not without purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I want to come to you personally first this morning, that all too often there have been things that have been placed in my life that have been meant to do harm, to throw uh, me off my path. And Lord, I want to confess when I have fallen short, when I have allowed uh, that which was intended for evil to be evil. Lord, I think we've probably all been there in some way. We've allowed the evil things uh, to drive us to despair, uh, to bitterness, and ultimately to revenge. How quick we are to cast an ill word to someone who speaks even the most basic thing that we perceive to be against us. How much we pride ourselves on our own character and how we feel the need to defend that when we know that the only person with whom our character uh, values or matters is you. Lord, help us as we have walked through the trials of this life to lean on you. That when life gets most difficult for us, when things challenge us more than normal, that we are driven to our knees, that we are driven back into your word even more than normal. Lord, we want to be found faithful. Each person in here wants to obey what you have commanded. 
We want to be available. Lord, we're making ourselves available to you. Help use us to bring glory to you in 2021, no matter what happens. Amen. Please stand if you're able, and I will read the benediction, and then we will have our closing song. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the face shine, his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Remember, church, you are sent. Amen. <laughs>